All right, so today, today we are getting into the Cenozoic era officially. We are moving past our age of dinosaurs, past that asteroid impact, and into our era, the era of mammals. And so you guys already learned last week how different the KPG extinction was than all the other big mass extinctions we've seen. This is a relatively instantaneous event. That's true for the actual like kill mechanisms. Um, but even all the devastation you guys learned about, all the things that happened as a result of that asteroid impact, very short-term global cooling, very long-term uh, warming on the scale of like hundreds or thousands of years, maybe. But really, all the effects kind of don't last all that long. You don't want to live your life or have your children live their life during this recovery interval. But on the order of thousands of years, things are, in terms of the climate system, pretty much back to normal. The difference is, is all these plants, when they regrow and you get your wet forest all returned everywhere, there's no more big animals. So it takes many, many millions of years for life to evolve and diversify again and fill niche space. I'm thinking mostly about the vertebrate animals here. But you're going to have pretty much a return to like that Cretaceous baseline geologically really fast. And so you have this dinosaur world, dinosaur climates, dinosaur continent configuration, but they're all gone now. It's really, really weird. Uh, this is a really lovely piece of paleo art. This is focusing on the paleobotany. Uh, there's a whole series of assemblages really well known from Colorado outside of Denver that preserve the plants really well in the Cretaceous and in the Paleogene. And so all of those leaf types and everything like that are known from real fossils. And so here's an idea of like what Colorado looks like, nice wet, humid forest in the early days of the Paleogene. And so as we get into our modern era, getting closer and closer to you and I in time, the data gets really, really, really good for all kinds of things. What you're looking at here is the temperature curve, the Earth's temperature, the Earth's like baseline climate over the last 66 million years. So to orient you a little bit, there's the asteroid impact. There's some things on here, like there's the deck and traps erupting right there. So you have your dinosaurs before that red line, no dinosaurs after that red line. You and I are here on this curve. And this curve is, I think, one of these things that like is unreal how stable it is. All the blue is data collection. The red line is the trend line. This is people going deep into the ocean, pouring into the sediments on the bottom of the ocean and looking at the little plankton rain, all the little dead bodies of all the plankton for all these millions of years, looking at the ratio of oxygen isotopes in the tests in the little bodies of those plankton. And they can use that oxygen isotope ratio to get a really, really reliable indicator of temperature. And again, this is organisms in the deep oceans, a place that is thermally insulated. It is really hard to change the degree temperature in deep, deep ocean water. The whole planet has to be warm or cool to make the deep oceans change temperature. So this isn't like a temperature thermometer out in the air somewhere. This is the deep ocean thermometer for the last 66 million years. This is very incredible. This provides a baseline to ask all kinds of other questions. What's going on on land? If this is what's going on in the oceans. But this is a very reliable indicator of the Earth's climate system in our whole era. So do me a favor, talk to your neighbors for a few minutes. There's all kinds of things to observe here. There's the Cenozoic era. I don't have the periods on here. Here's a couple other words you might have heard before. There's millions of years. Go ahead and talk to each other for a minute here. Take a, take a while to interpret this. What are you noticing? What's interesting? Yeah. Was that, was that too easy? 
All right, so what are some things people are observing, noticing? There's a lot going on here, a lot of fun stuff to talk about. There's like a constant, you know, uh, like like flow of you know highs and lows. Um, and when we get into the Miocene, it looks like you know it drops quite quite a bit to get cooler and starting to glacier to find So where where so okay, so John's talking about stuff going on in the Miocene, so like between here and here. If you guys are going to start talking about it getting cooler, where do you draw the line? Where does it start to get cooler? Oh, yeah, I guess. So. Well, no, I'm asking. Uh, I guess. You and I live in, you don't have to answer it yourself. Everybody can think about it. Like, we all live in an ice world. Ice means you guys live in a world where there's giant permanent ice sheets on the top and bottom of the planet. Antarctica is fully glaciated. Greenland's fully glaciated. And a lot of the time, in the last two and a half million years, huge pieces of Eurasia and North America are also glaciated. That's the usual circumstance for the last few million years. That has not been the circumstance almost at all. The last time you guys saw ice like that was in the Permian. The whole Triassic, the whole Jurassic, the whole Cretaceous, there's probably snow seasonally. Ice may be in mountains, glaciers may be in mountains, but nothing like this. Antarctica is a whole continent that is now completely encased. That is not the usual circumstance of Earth. But right now it is. It's the usual circumstance for our species evolution. It's the usual circumstance for our civilization, that's for sure. So that's interesting. Where do we draw the line? Where does it start to get cool? I'm not telling you I think there's an answer to that, but that's something you can think about. Don't worry, we'll get there. What other things we're talking about? I want to know back, particularly of the thermal maximum and 15, six million years ago. This one, which is real? That is real. Okay, well, I'm, I'm more interested in the plateau. I mean, this I, one? I expect, yeah. I expect huge amounts of CO2 to be released uh, during the end of the end jigsaw of the impact from limestone. From but it's, it's, I mean, you're right, but you can see right there. I mean, it's really not. That's why I'm curious. Yeah. Why, why is there this delay? I don't think there's any delay. I don't think the asteroid impact has any important long term effects on the climate. I think it ruins your life and it ruins thousands of years of time, but thousands of years of time isn't even visible on this diagram. Okay. It's super short. I'm still interested in mechanisms. <laughs> well, of course, mechanisms are important. I hope all of you are wondering about questions. What makes things warm? What makes things not warm? What makes things go around at all? Mechanisms are really important. All right, are we going to talk about the drivers that of are just like yeah. making things? Well, not of course, of course. I'm not going to get detailed. This is vertebrate paleontology, not uh, climatology. But we'll talk about it a little bit, of course. Some of these big transitions. I like how the Turconian thermal maximum is right out of that tiny little peak in the late mid late Miocene, mm -hmm. and the BGM is just completely unlaced. Yeah, well, that's true. Didn't make the figure. Couldn't tell you why. Yeah, Stuart. Um, it looks like at the start of the Pleistocene, you might have fluctuations of them. Oh, so the blue is the data, and the red is the trend line, and you're saying like bigger cloud of blue here. 
Yeah, so seasonality uh, and seasonality is one part of it, but then also the changing oscillation of the climate, interglacial and interglacial periods during the ice age. That's what we're living in right now. I agree with that. More variation around a mean in the last 2 million years than at other times. Pretty tight on the trend line through the Eocene and all that. Okay, there's a lot of things to take in here. Um, a lot of patterns. I think you guys can tell it's relatively cooler now than it would have been tens and tens of millions of years ago, but there's variety to that statement. And so this is the whole Cenozoic. We are, of course, gonna work our way through this timeline. Several of these climatic events are super, super important. We're gonna talk about some of the mechanisms, but today we're only going into the beginnings of the Cenozoic, into the Paleogene period. So if I insert the periods in there, there's the Paleogene. The Paleogene goes from 66 to 23. A huge amount of the Cenozoic era is this one period the Cretaceous, the Paleogene, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic. And so now, focusing in on just this, don't worry about this part right now. Some more specific questions for you guys to only focus on the Paleogene there. So go ahead and talk to each other again. I changes in it that seem important to you. This is a transition, I would say, that's pretty clear. So, like there's maybe a trend over millions and millions of years that you would never probably really notice unless you were taking very careful measurement. And then here's a pretty substantial shit uh, like Phase change. We go from this little silly category of warm to this little silly category of cool, um, but that's real. Something is happening right there. Some of you have been talking about it. Eastern Antarctica, which is the much bigger piece of Antarctica, we have evidence for the glaciation, the onset of that glaciation at this time. And so that continues to this day. And so what's happening here is almost certainly a configuration of the continental plates. South America and Antarctica finally say goodbye. Antarctica is now alone on the bottom of the planet and a current sets itself up that goes around Antarctica, climatically isolating it. 
Our planet, if you know about the atmosphere, air gen 10, the most simplified version possible is air is rising at the equator and coming down at the poles. There's a lot of cells in between that explain a lot of the climate. And so you're still gonna have very cold, very dry air at the poles. And now you have a continent with an ocean going around it in a big circle that keeps it isolated from the rest of the atmosphere also. So Antarctica very quickly falls into a cold state and gets glaciated. And that's in East Antarctica, we see it first. We don't see the glaciation of West Antarctica really strongly until here. So this is almost certainly due to continental configuration and ocean current, and that's it. What other transitions, what other things seem important? Middle Miocene is labeled transition. Middle Miocene. Yeah, Middle Miocene. I'm not talking about the Miocene today. Oh. <laughs> We're keeping in the Paleo gene. We got a whole three weeks to talk about the Cenozoic. We were just talking a moment ago about what defines changes in periods and epochs. And I was arguing that for this course, at least, it's changes in fossil assemblages. And that is where all of this comes from. And Paleontologists finding fossils and naming different periods. That is where the original names are. Okay. So what you could think of, though, is that 100 years ago or more, usually a lot more, when these periods are getting their names, people are finding fossils in the rocks, but no one has any idea of the absolute durations in time of these intervals. So the whole idea that the Pliocene is only two and a half million years old and the Eocene is 23 million years old, it used to just be one, two, three, four, five, six to the present. Now some of them are huge and some of them are small. You guys have also seen this in uh, all the geology we've seen so far. A lot of these divisions get made before we have the ability to absolutely constrain their dates. The geology must play a role because we what the Archean. There weren't any fossils then, so how do we define periods? But, uh, well, certainly there's a ge geological component to defining periods, but for these ones, fair enough. Okay. yeah, for these ones for sure, it's fossils. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's really fun that there's a time here in the Middle Eocene, this climatic optimum that we think is generally warmer than the end of the Cretaceous was. There's a period way back in the Cretaceous that's about this warm too, about 100 million years ago. And then there's this thing, which we're going to talk about. This is the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. This is a real thing where we see a very short lived, but very real, huge spike in global temperature. This is one of the events in Earth history that climate scientists use to talk about human induced climate change today, because this is an extremely rapid change that comes out of nowhere. And that's pretty much what we're going to all be living through over the next couple hundred years. And so this is something that's of real interest to climatologists. All right, let's talk about the Paleogene. So the Paleogene, we are now past dinosaur time. You still have a green world. Antarctica and South America are pretty close. Antarctica is nice and green, high sea levels, lots of it, uh, seas up on the continents. Much, much hotter than today, even though we're past dinosaur time. That PETM is some of the hottest climate globally that we're aware of in the fossil record, which I think is pretty fantastic. We have a pretty well-constrained cooling, an initiation of a cooling that starts in the mid-30s millions of years ago as Antarctica gets isolated way down there. When we talk about the animals, you guys, I hope by now, have seen this a lot from me. There are substantial evidences of radiations of all the crown group-like orders of birds, orders of mammals, orders of fishes. We get that from the DNA. And also, when we go look at the fossils, we find, you know, very few birds without teeth. And then all of a sudden, all the birds that are, we know in the paleogene, you get penguins and owls and all kinds of things. Amongst the mammals, you get the first primates, the first rodents, the first ungulates, the first whales even, all happening really quickly in the aftermath of this extinction as these animals are radiating. Flowering plants are everywhere, and a lot of the world where we have a good fossil record from, you can see North America there, very nice and green, is this deep, wet forest full of flowering plants. So I like to think of this as very much a dinosaur planet with no big dinosaurs anymore. That's how I would characterize the very beginnings of the Cenozoic. And so here's our mass extinction event at 66. Here's that hot spike at 56. And that's our paleogene there spread out. In the oceans, we're seeing the same pattern we see on land. A lot of the oceans becoming familiar to you guys. No more mosasaurs, no more plesiosaurs. How about whales? How about penguins? 
That's what's showing up going into the oceans in this period. And so those transitions, a whale, of course, is something we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on. A mammal adapting to the ocean realm uh, is extremely interesting. Same story in the oceans in terms of a lot of the rayfish fishes and elasmobranchs, the orders and families of sharks and reef fishes and you know those kind of things. Also, a lot of them are paleogene radiations. So I want to tell you guys about a couple vertebrate paleontology related pieces of that Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. So this really, really hot planet. Here's what the planet looks like at that boundary. And so you can see there's no ice up on the planet. This is, I think, one of the coolest fossil sites on the planet. It is way up here at the very top of Greenland. And so not only do you have these big, like, lounging mammals, these are early relatives. Uh, they're in the crown placental mammal group, but they're not related to any modern groups today. Um, but up there on the top of Greenland, think about what this means. The top of Greenland, there's fossils of palms, there's crocodiles, there's primates. That's how warm it is on the planet at this time, is that an almost polar, well, certainly polar ecosystem looks like that. I think that's pretty spectacular. And so even if you were like a climate, you know, somebody could do a climate curve, somebody can measure those isotopes at the bottom of the ocean, tell you it's hot. And then if you're a fossil person, you can be like, okay, put on your parka, take your shotgun for polar bears, go walk around Greenland and find palms and crocodiles. Okay, I believe you. It must have been pretty warm. The other thing I really, really, really like is that's a polar ecosystem. So what must it have been like at the equator during these times, especially during this Eocene, or sorry, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum? Well, I'll tell you, some of the biggest reptiles ever of their groups were around at this time. The largest snake ever is this animal, Titanoboa. It is not from the Mesozoic. It is not from our time. It is one from the Paleocene and the early Eocene. Titanoboa, as you might guess, is an absolutely massive snake. Uh, this snake is somewhere all in the order of like 45-ish feet long. Uh, other animals are there too. There's pretty decent crocs. There's pretty humongous turtles. What's interesting is that herpetologists who study fossils have been able to show us that squamates, snakes and lizards, their maximum body size almost perfectly follows the temperature. As high as you can make the temperature, they just seem to get bigger. Whereas crocs and turtles are a little more constrained. They seem to like really get big when there's a lot of water and it's not really so much about temperature for them. That's pretty new research and I think it's really fun. You guys know this is a little pitosaur and these are both archosaur marks. So they're different kinds of reptile. Seems like swamates, if you turn up the temps, they'll just get huge, which is really fun. There's other fossils also of animals from around this time that are quite big. But the fact that the largest snake ever is living here in the tropics, while up at the top of Greenland, there's monkeys and palm trees, should really let you know how cool it is. There is a vertebra of a very large anaconda, which is one of the largest snakes we have today. There's Titanoboa's vertebrae right next to it, just to make the point really clear to you. There's a really gorgeous fossil of Titanoboa um, and of one of these turtles. Uh, they're all from these big coal mines in Colombia. So you guys can see pictures online of these coal miners just coming across them. And there's this one fossil Titanoboa that's like not 100% complete, but it has the skull and a lot of the body. And it's just like a big, it's like this on the ground. You know, like co coiled up position. <laughs> it's just like, looks like a dinosaur skeleton, how big it is, but it's just a giant curled up boa. Pretty awesome. So this is a myth in the crowd group of snakes, right? It's related to boas. We have a boa here in Idaho, right? The rubber boa, if you guys have ever seen it. It's like this big, <laughs> which is pretty fun. So let's talk about the mammals though, because today we're gonna to be focusing on the birds a little bit, but a lot about the mammals. This period, the beginning of the Cenozoic is super, super well studied, especially because most of vertebrate paleontology history, if you guys go back and look at like the conferences over the last hundred years, it's a lot of mammal people. We care a lot about mammal origins. We care a lot about our own origins. So this time period is really well studied. This is a really gorgeous mural. It's one of many by the same artist that's on display in the Smithsonian. If you guys go to DC, you can see this mural. This is showing you Wyoming, jungle Wyoming in the early 50s, uh, meaning 50 million years ago or so, 54 million years or so ago. So the early parts of the Eocene, showing all kinds of awesome animals that are found together in Wyoming. I'd like you guys to see who you recognize here. Mammals are diversifying. Some of our familiar faces are around, some of them are not. Um, who do you see in this beautiful mural? It stands the test of time, even though it's many decades old at this point. So go ahead and talk to yourselves. Who do you see? What's going on in this jungle in Wyoming? 
What do you think that uh bluish grayish All right, so who are we recognizing? Who do we think we're seeing up here? Cats and dogs, bumpers, crocodiles, turtles, deer, or right off her. An unhelpful list, just shouted into the void. <laughs> which one's which? No, no idea. Some that looks like that. Where? Which one? Big one. The big one. This animal is a, it's called a uintathir. Uh, it is related almost certainly to the ungulates of today. It's not particularly close to the, any of the living groups. So it has a lot of interesting things going on in its face, including some big, I'm gonna say saber type teeth, not tusks, but interesting structures in the head there. Nothing to do with any diversity today, it goes extinct. But yeah, maybe related to the ungulates. All right, who else wants to call some out and like say what, which one is which? I'm not sure, but it looks I agree, by the way, with crocodiles and turtles. So we can skip that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not sure, but to the left, it looks like some kind of like horse. This guy? This one? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is an early, uh, we're going to learn about it today, parasodactyl. This is the even, or sorry, odd toed ungulates. There's a few on here. This one is a really well known one, Hyracus. It is controversial. It might be a really early rhino. It might be on the horsey side of things. Either way, it's a parasodactyl. Uh, so in that group with horses and rhinos and tapers today, these are little early relatives of tapers right here. You guys know about tapers, good for you. This one is for sure early horse relative right there. Back here are some other parasodactyls. These are animals that are also horse relatives, even though they end up looking like rhinos. This is an animal called a brontothere, really early brontothere. We'll talk about those later. So a bunch of hoopy stuff. These two, and only these two, our early relatives of the even hoofed ungulates, things like deer and cattle and goats and giraffes and stuff. Uh, these are two early artiodactyls. Only those two are artiodactyls on here. All right, what else do people see? I think they know which one's which. The upper right, um, I can't really see enough detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought like maybe you had some lemur vibes. Yeah, so these two are both early primates. This one's a rodent. This one's a rodent too, as I'm sure you're not surprised. It's hard. What I like about this is that many of these groups have nothing to do with today's diversity. They are early radiations of placental mammals. Some of them are related to today's ungulates in some way. Some of them are related to today's carnivores in some way, but they're their own thing and they go extinct. This thing. This one, which is spectacular. Talk to you about it if you want me to. This animal here, which I'm sure if you guys glanced at it, I mean, it looks like a fantasy animal. Uh, what do you, what would you guess based on this vibe that this animal ecology is? <laughs> Land eater. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, these are, look like carnivorous mammals, I would hope, you think, right? Don't these look like the ones you don't want to stumble upon in the middle of the jungle? 
These are really interesting animals. They're called mesonychids. They are related to today's hoofed animals. There's a whole clade of early ungulate relatives that are carnivorous in the paleogene, which is really fun. Uh, this is another one of my favorites. This is an early carnivoran relative, although it's not in the extant diversity. It's not in the crown group. It has a great name, Patriophilus, the father cat. A good name. It's not related to cats. It's its own kind of thing, but I think that's pretty fun. And there's a bunch of other weirdos down here. Nobody said anything about this poor lizard who's getting killed twice, but there's a lot going on. What I like about the Eocene is that there's a couple of Lagerstatten all over the world that let us really have a really beautiful picture of this time. So here's that one of those fossil sites. If any of you guys have ever driven into southwestern Wyoming from Idaho, it's super easy. You can go to the National Monument there called Fossil Butte, which preserves a bunch of levels of this fossil lake. And so here's some of these fossils you can get from the Eocene of Wyoming. Again, I'm saying Wyoming. Uh, who are you guys seeing out here? What, what looks interesting to you? Talk to each other about these beautiful fossils. so obviously this isn't a lot like the Wyoming you guys know. Not only are there big, beautiful crocodiles, this is a really nice specimen. I almost put a picture of Henry that I have uh, in here, standing next to a cast of this. If you want to see the real one, you have to go to Chicago, fortunately. It's in the field museum. Uh, obviously, really fun stuff like stingrays in this lake. Pretty cool. Nice things like boas, soft shell turtles. Different than you might find in Wyoming today, that's for sure. Uh, this is a frigate bird. Frigate birds are those giant birds. Some of them have the big red row pouches today on some of the species. So they're like oceanic fish eating and kleptoparasitic birds that steal from other fishing birds. Fun to have one of these seabirds at these giant lakes that were in Wyoming. The swamp hen's a little rail relative. So kind of got a purple head with a little red on it. If you guys go to Florida, it wouldn't be hard to see these. Fun to have them in Wyoming. And then probably the, mm, it's hard to say, but one of the coolest fossils from Fossil Lake are two different species of really early bat. The oldest bat fossil, the only things we have to tell us about early bat evolution in terms of a literal fossil record come from these lakes in Wyoming. There are two species with several specimens each, and this is what the earliest bats look like. That's frustrating. They already have their wings. So what does the transition look like from some little shrewy, interesting relative to get to the fully flighted bats? We don't know. You guys have seen pterosaurs are an open question. There's a lot of interesting debate on how pterosaurs evolved flight. You can see, I hope, that for dinosaurs and the birds, we actually have plenty of fossils and people are pretty comfortable with a few different schemes. But bats show up like this. And it's kind of like, man, who's going to help us find an earlier bat? But that's what we have. That's what the fossil record is right now. I think that's extremely cool. Here's another pit, just a little younger. This is from the forests of Germany. This one's 48 million years old. Go ahead and talk about this one.
So again, really early relative, early members of so many of these plays that should be familiar, right? Horses, pangolins, primates. This doesn't look like Germany today, right? <laughs> Big snakes, alligators, pangolins. So these are animals you might see over in Eurasia or Africa today in that part of the world, but in a much more tropical or subtropical distribution, not way up in Germany. I really love this pangolin. But if you guys know what a tamandua is, it's one of the anteater species in South America today. When this thing was first found, it was thought to be an anteater. So it's the Euro tamandua. I hope that's not much of a job for you. <laughs> but it's actually not a tamandua at all. It's a pangolin, which is not an anteater. It's a different kind of thing. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, I like the idea of alligators in Germany. Alligators are pretty restricted today to the New World. There's one species in China, but alligators in Europe is pretty cool. I love the snakes. Big constricting snakes in Europe and Asia and Africa are pythons. And so here's an early python. Whereas in the Americas, we don't have pythons. We've got boas. And here we have in Wyoming this big boa, which is very fun. So we're seeing these distributions existing in different ways, even back then. I just like showing you guys this because this is vertebrate paleontology. And Messel and Fossil Lake are two of these, like, you can't be more important sort of sites in the history of the discipline and also in the specimens that they preserve. This is how we understand the early radiation of today's biology. We can use the DNA of the living things to estimate, but you can actually look at these things to get the anatomy straight, to figure out the different patterns and specifics, which I think is spectacular. So we're going to be talking a lot about biogeography in the Cenozoic. The story of today's distribution, I'm only going to be talking about vertebrate animals, but there's many other organisms this would work for, is in a large part determined by continental configurations, continental connections, continental breakup. We are going to see a lot of patterns that like demystify why things are here and not there because continents move around. When Darwin is alive for most of the 20th century, continents don't move around. So people say all kinds of crazy stuff to explain why things are here and there and not there. But now that we know continents move, things make a lot of sense. So I wanted you guys to really take this in. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on it. You can see where India is now relative to where you last saw it in the Cretaceous. So talk to each other, what's different? Where is their connection? What places are isolated? I want you to have this really straight in your head. So talk to each other, be as specific as you can. Take a few minutes. Okay, so let's start easy. Let's start easy. Let's start easy. What like continental scale land masses are pretty clearly isolated relative to each other? Australia. Australia. I would agree. Australia is relatively isolated. It does not have any shallow sea connections with anybody else. There's Australia, and there's this little friend, Tasmania. There's its friend, New Guinea, which right now is totally underwater, and not at all above water. OK, what else? Antarctica. Antarctica down here. What else? Kind of looks like that South America is still isolated, but by a little bit. South America and Antarctica hang on to each other for a long time. We're going to talk about that. That 34 million official break where ocean currents change and start circling Antarctica, we think, that is at 34 million. This map is much younger, much older, I'm sorry, than that. So this is still interesting. But yes, a little bit of a break here between South America and Antarctica. And South America is certainly not touching anybody over here. Although this is kind of fun and interesting, isn't it? But OK, what else? 
Africa, although getting a little flirty up along the top here. Interesting. Africa, Madagascar. Madagascar left with India a long time ago, but the Madagascar stopped and India absolutely did not stop, and I can't tell you why. <laughs> but India is now fully connected up here, getting even more connected. It's going to start forming those Himalayas as it smashes into Asia. Asia and Europe are still one big place. Obviously, there's lots of really interesting things happening on a small scale with all these inland seas in Eurasia. And Eurasia is continuously communicating in one way or another with North America right here. We also have decent evidence of animals and plants spreading like this across Greenland, although that gets harder and harder as the Atlantic opens farther and farther. So basically you have these Northern continents that do have good evidence of communication in terms of species spreading back and forth. And then you have these like relative island land masses all over what we might call the Southern part of the world, even though there are some of them sticking up above the equator. That is really cool and really important. So now let's look at some of the animals we are really familiar with already. So there's 27 orders of mammals today. When we've talked about mammal biodiversity in this class so far, we've been pretty zoomed out on the modern biodiversity. You guys have seen mammal evolution in the context of like the whole story from Amniota, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous story. Now we're getting up into the Cenozoic. And so that split between therian mammals, placentals and marsupials, and monotremes, you guys know happened way, way, way back in the Jurassic. And what's really cool is that split for the crown group of mammals back in the Jurassic it's also in the Jurassic that we have the split between the marsupial metatherian mammals and the crown group marsupials, and the eutherian mammals, the crown group placentals. And then, of course, there's tons of extinct clades that are part of the crown mammal radiation. And something that I hope you guys kind of picked up on when you saw that diversity lecture back in the Cretaceous is that many of these groups actually make it across the boundary also. It's not just our three big groups that make it to today that survived the asteroid. Several of these other clades do live for a while in the Paleogene, which is pretty cool to me. So let's talk about the first uh, earliest diverging, we could say, group of crowd mammals today, the monotremes, and give them their due. So here's today's monotreme diversity. If you're not familiar with it, let's talk about it because it's fantastic. These are animals today only found in Australia, and then the echidnas are up in New Guinea, some of them. These are very fantastic. I'm so, 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 so pleased that they're not extinct because you guys know they lay eggs, they sweat a patch of milk onto their bellies instead of having a nipple. So they do all these things that other mammals absolutely don't do that help us understand what must have been happening in different parts of mammal evolution. That egg laying particularly is fantastic. What's really fun is that these are not some primitive kind of mammal. Obviously they are hyper derived in their own ways. Echidnas are little like termite and ant foragers with really long noses and really long tongues to suck up ants and things like that. They've got huge claws on their feet for busting into those hills, digging up under wood, excavating the insects they eat. Whereas platypuses are like freshwater carnivores, mostly of invertebrates, but they've got electrosensitive bills. So do the echidnas, which is pretty bizarre to think about, uh, to chase down their prey. Platypuses, the males, have a spur, it's one of their tarsal bones on their feet, that's venomous. This is insane. These are not <laughs> like other mammals. Now, fossil monotremes are found in places other than Australia and New Guinea. That's fun. Where would you expect, here's some platypus teeth, where would you expect fossil monotremes to maybe be found? Antarctica. Antarctica? Anywhere else? South America. South America? I love it. So this is a fossil of a platypus from the Paleogene. It's called Monotrematum Sudamericanum because it is from South America. And so it's cool to think about today, there are only monotremes on this landmass, but in the fossil record, you guys already heard in the lecture a couple of weeks ago that there is a monotreme, couple of monotreme fossils from Argentina in the Cretaceous. So in South America, there's monotreme diversity at this time, but today they only live here. Ooh. What could have been their possible route, you know, the former range of these animals? If you had to draw a big circle, what would you include? Antarctica. Antarctica is fantastic. I just wanted somebody to say it out loud instead of me. So that's really interesting. We don't have any fossil monotremes from Antarctica because we only have a really sparse fossil record from Antarctica, but I'm really intrigued, and I hope you guys are too, to imagine these forests, remember at the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, there's palm trees and crocodiles up here. What's going on way down here during the Paleogene? 
I bet you there's monitoring spread like this, and that's pretty interesting. All right, so you guys know that placentals and marsupials are united in this clade theria. I'm actually going back old school and giving you guys an actual synapomorphine for theria. We haven't had a synapomorphine in quite a while. Uh, to unite today's marsupial and placental mammals relative to monotremes. And that synapomorphy is the placenta. So marsupial mammals also have the full-on mammalian placenta. The difference is, is that when they have their babies, the babies are born relatively early in development. It doesn't change the fact that that placenta is still how that baby is fed as a growing embryo uh, or fetus, really, in the mother's body. And so placenta is an extremely derived condition for taking care of your baby in that amniotic egg instead of like a yolk full of nutrients and a waste sac that gets filled as the baby processes the yolk. You have an interfingering with the mother's circulatory system, nutrient systems, the baby's being fed via the mother's system. And so here's a little baby kangaroo born only about this big and then on its own after it leaves the vagina, it climbs up her stomach with its little arms, grabbing the hair and then goes into the pouch. Whereas we and other placental mammals, when we're born, we come out, and oftentimes they don't show you this, but the placenta comes out too. Um, and this is something that is very different from other kinds of amniotic organisms, including egg-laying monotremes, is this level of investment during gestation. These are the animals that are really, really abundant all over the world in terms of mammals when the extinction happens. Here's the paleogene in Montana, the formation that is right above the health tree formation, the one we just talked about with T-Rex and Triceratops. There are plenty of metatherian and even marsupial fossils from the paleogene of Montana, just like there are plenty of uh, placental mammals known from those same places. So these two groups are really spread in almost the same way across the planet at the very, very, very beginning of the Cenozoic. And so here's our modern day marsupial diversity. There are seven orders of marsupials today. I'm sure you guys recognize some of them. This one lives with us, the only one. Fun things like wombats, Tasmanian devils, other fun stuff like that we will talk about. And so I have one feature I want to give you guys for marsupiality. And I'm guessing you can guess what that feature is gonna be. Marsupials are all united by the fact that they have a marsupium which is the technical name for the pouch. So this is a specialized, I don't know if we want to call it like a chamber, a pocket on the belly, usually the abdomen of female marsupials. As I said, they have their babies via live birth. The baby breaks from its placenta. The little embryo climbs from her vagina up into the pouch all on its own. It does not get assistance. Little kangaroos especially are really interesting. They're also big enough, you can see them. Uh, they have really well muscled, in quotes, muscled arms and not really legs because they just do this to pull themselves up into the pouch. The nipples of marsupials are inside the pouch and the baby completes developing just like we placentals do inside the mother the whole time uh, for quite a while and even much longer than us uh, placental mammals would do because of that pouch. You guys have probably seen at zoos or on videos or even in the wild, maybe, I don't know. Uh, baby marsupials that are, you know, kind of at that borderline of being too big to go back into the pouch, but they still are used to going in and out of the pouch. I want to emphasize that this is the derived condition. We have a lot of really good evidence that like the big placental mammal birth situation is the ancestral state for even some of those extinct groups. And that marsupials have the more highly evolved, whatever you want to call it, derived condition of reproduction in this pouch. I always love this picture, uh, but it makes me very uncomfortable. This little baby wombat looks too big, and I think its claws look too big to be going in and out of the mom's pouch all the time. <laughs> but I think they're pretty incredible organisms. So yeah, this is a wombat. I guess she's taking a nap. Um, I guess I didn't say what that was. <laughs> so here's our Therian sisters, the things that are also Therians with us, but are not placental. These are the marsupials. Do me a favor, talk to each other. Do you recognize any of these organisms? These are the seven orders. That's what these photos represent. Yeah. 
Was anybody not aware? Was anybody not aware before today that there is a mole that is marsupial, like has a little pouch, has its little babies? Did not know that. I also like this picture very much because it is just fully wolfing down this gecko head first. <laughs> Pretty gnarly. Look at those claws on the marsupial mole. When people think of marsupials, they usually think of this one or this order, kangaroos and koalas and wombats and things like that. This is easily the most speciose order of marsupials today. This is a big, big, big clade. This one, Manito del Monte, is one species all by itself in its own order. Pretty cute. Manito del Monte, to be clear, means the little monkey of the mountain, which is a great name. All right. Something that we can see in the fossil record to help us recognize marsupials are these epipubic bones off the pubis. Here's your ilium. Here's your ischium. Here's your pubis. Here's your acetabulum. There's your sacral vertebrae. You guys all know what those things are. Marsupials have these epipubic bones that stick up off the front of the pubis. So something we can see if we recognize them. Also, their teeth are different than uh, sorry, placental teeth, and so we can recognize those as well. But obviously, they diversify in all kinds of different body plans. There's running animals, climbing animals, carnivorous animals, herbivorous animals, burrowing animals. All kinds of fun things are happening in marsupial evolution over the last 60 some million years. So, biology fact time. Talk to your neighbors. If you had a, had a crayon and you had a color, where do you find marsupials right now, today, naturally, not introduced, natural distribution of marsupials today? Talk to each other. Yeah, Okay, so where do they live? Australia, where else? South America, where else? End of list. <laughs> Australia, absolutely, of course. Crocodile Dundee, down under kangaroos. Come on. South America and North America. All a lot of diversity in South America, even more diversity in Australia, a very, very, very slight diversity in North America. The diversity we have, there's the Virginia opossum, which you guys have in this state, and also a couple other members of that order specifically. Those are recent immigrants from when South and North America end up connecting. We're not gonna talk about that today. But for the most part, all the marsupial fossil record is here and here. It is not anywhere else. No, 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 no. Yes and yes. That's interesting. We can take a phylogeny of marsupials today. Here's the seven orders of marsupials broken up a little bit because there's so many of these diprotodonts. And so there's the phylogeny. I think you guys can read it branching, and you're getting a little bit of biogeography in here as well. That one only also is in North America, but don't worry about that. Talk to each other and interpret this phylogeny. How would you plot, how would you plot the biogeography of living marsupialia, the crown group across the continents today? I'll let you work out the black and gray for yourself. What? It's <laughs> 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 Okay, so what's black mean on this phylogeny? 
Australia. Australia. One, two, three, four orders today are found in Australia. What does gray mean on this phylogeny? South America. South America. This order is in South America. This order is in South America. They're only in South America, except for this one who just recently popped up into North America, but thanks to the Americas. And then this little one, little species all by itself in its own order, also only found in South America. Say you find it in like Peru, up in those cloud forests with all those wonderful birds. But based on its anatomy and morphology, a long time ago, people said that little marsupial doesn't look like those. It looks like these. And so there's a clade called Australadelphia, the Aus southern is what it really means, southern marsupials, southern possums is what that translates to. Australia is obviously pretty in the front of your mind when you read that word. And the Manita del Monte, this little species, is sister to all of the Australian ones. So you have a paraphyletic grouping of marsupials in South America, and then a monophyletic clade in Australia. And so what's a possible connection there, just like monotremes? Of course it is Antarctica. And what could be better than the fact that we do have some Eocene fossils from Antarctica, and some of the only fossils that go in this order are from Antarctica. This little animal, Woodburnidon casei, is one of these little Manito del Monte marsupial relatives. And its fossils literally come from Antarctica. So we can be really confident that at the time, marsupials exist in this beautiful Antarctica, South America, Australia distribution that today is broken because the continents have moved and Antarctica has frozen over. So this little dude, who I've never seen, I would love to go to South America and see one, uh, is super important to helping us understand the biogeography of marsupials. I think that's pretty special. I hope you do too. Eocene Antarctic marsupials, exactly what you would want to see. All right, now let's talk about placental mammals. Here are the placental mammals. There's 19 orders of placental mammals today. No matter how many species they have, some of them have one, some of them have 2,300. <laughs> All of them get one picture on this slide. This is the molecularly derived phylogeny of placental mammals. Again, something that we've been getting really used to in the last, like, I'm going to say 12 or 15 years. Uh, it's getting more and more supported every day. I don't think it's likely to change too much at all anymore. Here's how placental mammals are related to each other. I hope you recognize many of these things. You probably don't recognize all of them. That's good. Talk to your neighbors, please, about this stuff. All right, so let's do the first question. Any interrelationships here that are surprising to you? Maybe you didn't even know what to expect if you had to suddenly make a tree for all 19 placentals. You're all comfortable with the fact that they're mammals and they're placental mammals, but when they go together, Anything on here that's surprising people? Pachyderms are about as far from each other as they could be. Oh, the two pachyderms. Do you mean this one? I do. The rhino? And this one, the elephant? What about the hippo? Hippo gets to be a pachyderm sometimes. It means thick skin. That's in this group. So yes, being a big, thick-skinned mammal, unfortunately for the Victorian scientists, <clears throat> does not equal evolutionary relationship, correct? What else? What's the hedgehog doing? 
Which one? The one by the bat. There you go. Just want to make sure you know which one's the hedgehog. <laughs> yep. There's the hedgehog. What do you mean? What's it doing? It looks like it's curled up and being cute. <laughs> So these are insectivorous mammals. They're called Eulipatiflins, is the technical name. This is hedgehogs, shrews, moles, a bunch of really cool, uh, I almost said this, a bunch of really cool Caribbean stuff like selenodons and moon rats and stuff like that. Moon rats are in Asia, but little teeny carnivorous, mostly or insectivorous mammals in that order. There they are. I think they're kind of just hanging out by themselves, what it looks like to me. What other relationships are people struck by? Is that a pangolin with the hyena? Yeah. Yes. Pangolins are these very armored uh, insectivorous, like termite and anteating animals, and they are sister to carnivora. So that's the hyena, but that hyena is representing walruses and seals and bears and wolverines and dogs and cats and all that. You know what's really cool is, is back in the 1800s and early 1900s, this relationship was found based on morphology. People had the anatomy and they're like, pangolins go with carnivores. And now the molecules are like, yeah, they do go with carnivores. <laughs> so it's not always that we get it wrong with the anatomy. That has a name. We're going to talk about those animals. Some of the things you saw in that Wyoming slide, the early radiation of placental mammals in the Eocene and the Paleocene, a lot of those things are like here, 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 and this like kind of nexus. But they don't go with any of those groups one at a time. Any other relationships people are curious about? Surprise back? I'd say that I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, what is that species that's right of the squirrel, but left of the baboon? <laughs> so this is an animal called a tree shrew. Actual squirrels go over here with the hamster in rodents. This thing looks like a squirrel. You're totally right. It's called a tree shrew. And then this one is called a flying lemur, which is hilarious because it does not fly and it is not a lemur. It is a gliding animal. It might be our sister. It might be sister to this thing. This is a little bit controversial still. There's only a few species, I think only two, and they live in Southeast Asia. They're gliding animals. I'm gonna show you a picture of them. They might be the closest relatives of primates. That's us. You're in the baboon, by the way. You and gorillas and lemurs are all right here. Okay, I thank you that nobody said anything about this. That's fine, we'll get to it later, I guess. Here's how the uh, taxonomy fits on to our modern understanding of molecular trees and then the fossils that we're finding to help explain a lot of these transitions. There's placentalia, this big monophyletic clade of placental mammals. And there's one character I wanna give you guys for placentalia that's certainly true in the modern. And what's interesting is that right now in terms of research, it's getting controversial for like how this fits in with the other extinct clades of therian relatives. And that's this prolonged gestation. Relative to marsupials, which unfortunately are our only comparison point, like I said, it's possible some of the Mesozoic animals, like multi-tuberculates, reproduce like we do. It's hard to know. This prolonged gestation, no matter what the body size, no matter what the litter size, placental mammals tend to have an internal gestation period that's much longer than you would expect. And so babies come out relatively developed. Some of them are born altricial, like these teeny little buddies here, and they need some care immediately for a while, maybe a long while after they're born. Some are precocial, like this giraffe, who's gonna be expected to stand up and walk really quickly after she's born. But still, prolonged gestation. Obviously, there's really interesting biological questions about litter size. How many babies does this shrew have versus how many babies does this whale have? The answer being almost certainly one in a whale. Also, I like to preach it very much because everyone looks at like pigs on their sides or dogs on their sides when they do the like mama. And I like armadillo, that's a mammal too. And I want you guys to look at that. <laughs> These little, little pink armadillo babies. They don't even have hard shells yet, they're squishies. I think that's fun. So prolonged gestation is certainly a feature of placentals. And so what's really, really, really exciting about having higher mammal relationships, the ordinal, interordinal relationships kind of sorted out now, is that these phylogenies actually solve a lot of problems that existed in our understanding of mammal evolution and mammal biogeography, mammal evolutionary history. And so if I put these names on, there's four big, big, big clades that are pretty robustly supported now. This one is called Xenarthra. We're gonna talk about it. Today's armadillos and today's sloths and anteaters. Afrotheria, which I hope you can guess translates to African beasts. Aardvarks, these things we'll talk about later. Manatees, elephants. Up at the top is a big clade, but I'm gonna break it up into two. One is Uarchontoglaris, it's a terrible word, I'm sorry, but that's our group. 
These three are called UR contents. These two are called glearies. So somebody just comboed them into UR conto glearies. Primates, rodents, bunnies, and those oddballs. And then finally over here, the Laurasia theaters. Laurasia is the northern continent. If you remember when Pangaea broke up, it's Gondwana and Laurasia. So these are these Laurasian northern, meaning North America and Eurasia. Beasts, hedgehogs, bats, pangolins, carnivorans, and the two groups of hoofed animals, odd-hoofed and even-hoofed placental mammals. Okay, so how does this topology and these clades that are now really well supported help us with our problems? Well, all we have to do is look at the map. Here's the world of the paleogene. You have to imagine that there's little tiny fuzzball mammals distributed maybe randomly, probably not though, all over these continents. The asteroid impact happens, the dinosaurs are gone, and then all of these continents have to rebuild themselves. All of these continents have their own mammals that are gonna adapt and radiate and fill new niche space. And so you guys already identified a bunch of these land masses that are isolated. Let's talk about South America first. When it comes to placental mammals, one of those groups that is really robustly supported, like I said, are the xenarthrins. The xenarthrins are only found in South America. There are armadillos in Texas and Florida because they walked up here from Mexico just like opossums did. But for almost the entirety of the Cenozoic, the fossil record of these two lineages, some of which are quite impressive, you guys probably know something about giant ground sloths now, sloths and antigenous armadillos, their fossil record is completely contained to South America. So these are the living endemic placental mammals on a long geological time scale anyway, when we talk about endemism, to South America. We're gonna see some really, really cool fossil xenarthrins. There's many other clades of placental mammals that of course make their way to South America, but starting way back in the Paleogene, you are gonna have only really these placentals that are alive now having their ancestors there. Something that we can use to recognize xenarthrins in the fossil record is in their vertebrae. Here's the vertebrae of a rabbit, post zygopophysis, pre zygopophysis, the vertebrae attach in a way that you guys have seen in reptiles and all kinds of other tetrapods, in armadillos and sloths and anteaters. Of course, there's a pre zygopophysis and a post zygopophysis, but there's also an accessory articulation. Where those two connect, there's another process that comes in also, and that's called the xenarthrus process. And so armadillos, sloths, anteaters tend to have extremely rigid dorsal vertebral columns. We can talk about why there's a lot of function that goes into it, climbing, burrowing, busting stuff up, but we can recognize them easily in the fossil record because of those processes. And that's where the name for the clade comes from, Xenarthra, is from these extra processes in their dorsal vertebrae. So these two are the living placental mammals from South America and their distribution there can be explained by the continents in our new molecular phylogeny. Africa is another place that at the beginning of the Paleogene is pretty much all by itself. Madagascar has a little bit of communication with it, but not as much as you might expect for how big they both are and how close they are. So what's going on in Africa? Well, of course, those are these Afrotherian mammals. Here's those Afrotheres. They're pretty spectacular. Hyraxes, dugongs and manatees, elephants are a clade, and then these three, aardvarks, tenrex, and elephant shrews are also a clade. You wouldn't be the first person to notice Afrotheres seem to have pretty interesting noses. Something fun is happening with the soft tissue of their face. That's ongoing research that people are always trying to poke into. Is it just a lot of convergence or are they all doing the same kind of thing from an ancestor? I think that's pretty fun. Hyraxes, dugongs, and elephants got put together also back in the 1800s based on anatomy. And that's now something we find with the molecules also. They basically have their teeth erupt, their molar teeth. You guys saw those elephant teeth yesterday in the same kinds of pattern. Just pretty, pretty cool. I'll let you leave that a little bit. Africa is one of the first of these island continents to meet up with the northern two continents, Eurasia and North America. And so a lot of things have happened on Africa since the origination of these placental groups. But I really want to encourage you guys to think about what must Africa have been like when it was still an island and it only had these types of placental mammals on it, the early relatives. That's pretty fun. Oh, there it is. I said it, but I already had it up here. Imagine Paleogene Africa with only the early relatives of these organisms. All right, the Northern continents, 
Eurasia and North America definitely communicate quite a bit, both over the North Atlantic in the beginning of the period and all throughout via Alaska and Russia pretty much till today, on, off, on, off, on, off, able to cross between. And so most placental mammal ordinal diversity is up there in those Northern continents. Let's talk about North America first. Oh no, that's the two of them, North America and Eurasia. So here's UR contiglaris. Um, I'll give you guys a second to look at these organisms because especially that colugo, that, that flying lemur, and that tree shrew you maybe haven't seen before. These are fun animals. Uh, I like us primates being related to these four other orders. You might want to be related to like tigers or something, but you're not. <laughs> you're related to the rodents and the bunnies and then some other weird animals. These animals have kind of been put together for a while based on morphology. Bats were also part of this story. People thought maybe bats were one of our closer relatives. You can see that's not supported anymore. But for a long time, these two, rabbits and rodents, rabbits usually means like hares, bunnies, and then if you guys know pika, we have pika in Idaho and up in Wyoming, these little cutie pie animals that collect wildflowers. Not as diverse a clade, it's called lagomorphs, as the rodents. Rodents are easily the most diverse species clade of mammals today. These two have always been put together because they both have little detail differences, ever growing incisors in their mouth, top and bottom. So you guys probably know what rodent teeth look like. So yesterday Weston's talking to you about tusks. These animals don't have tusks, but they do have ever growing teeth, with enamel on one side only that grow in that circular pattern for gnawing their food, chewing up their food, getting their food into their mouths. So rodents and rabbits have put together as glearies for a long time. Those three have been put together as uarconta for a long time. And it's been the molecules that have helped solidify them together in this one monophyletic clade. We'll talk a lot about rodents as we keep going. Here's the other big group, those Laurasiatheres. So these are the most morphologically diverse mammals, placental mammals, easily. This clade includes bats. This clade includes pangolins. This clade includes moose and whales. By the way, this moose is also representing all whales and dolphins. We'll talk about that later. Here's the six orders of Laurasia theres. Many of these relationships have been put together for a while. Some of them, like cementing bats and these little dudes, shrews, moles, and hedgehogs, has only been possible because of the molecules. And so I did all this just to help you guys build up a story. So this is kind of a silly, oversimplified cartoon, but I hope it's really helpful for understanding some of these weird distributions we see in the modern world. If you go back to the Paleogene, this landmass has xenarthrins, I'll put them up, xenarthrins, marsupials, and monotremes. This one's got marsupials, maybe monotremes, we don't know, but it feels like they should be there. This one's only got marsupials and monotremes. Does that make sense? I think this is really fun because as the Cenozoic unfolds and these continents move around, we're gonna see interchange. Africa's got all those Afrotherian mammals. This one especially is out there on Madagascar, although there are some mainland Africa relatives of this little clade. That's where these animals originate. And then we get up into the northern continents, UR contiglaries and Laurasiatheria are spread out across North America and Eurasia. I've only put the UR cottons up here right now. These two are only in Southeast Asia today, and that's where almost all their fossil record is. These two, rodents and rabbits, seem to also have a Eurasian origin, but the earliest primates are over here in America, North America, it's pretty fun. I could do the same thing for the Laurasia theres on these Northern continents. Bats, carnivores, parasodactyls, all also have good early fossil records in North America, whereas things like pangolins and hedgehogs and whales, artiodactyls, have good fossil records over in Eurasia. But either way, there's a lot of communication. They're almost contemporaneous. You guys saw Wyoming and Germany having fossils of organisms like these. And so this is a little bit of a silly cartoon, but if you think about the distribution of mammals today and the weird problems that it has, now that we have these molecular phylogenies, we have these land masses and land masses we know can communicate with one another that help us understand the distribution of these organisms. I think that's really, really cool. We have very few bits of time left. I won't do this whole thing. I'll just do one. We don't have time to do the bird story, but we have a little bit. The exact same thing is now possible with birds as is possible with mammals. Don't worry, we're not going to do the same level of detail. There's over 40 orders of birds. Here's a handful of them. Please humor me for at least a minute here. Look at this slide. Any relationships here surprise you? This is based on a, more, a topology that just came out a few, like two weeks ago, um, but it's pretty well supported. 
Do we ever talk about that for a second? Yeah. Also, there's press that are. Yeah, I don't know. Any relationships surprising anybody on here? Hummingbirds, pelicans, and penguins. And albatross. These ones have gone together for a while now. This one's a real problem child. It moves around a lot. If I had made this phylogeny three weeks ago, hummingbirds would have been right here. So they just found this. I'm not sure what I think about it, but they have, they have good evidence for it. I want to tell you guys before we end here today, because I will let you go. This is one of my favorite relationships in all of bird phylogeny because I really, really, really like imagining this common ancestor. This is an albatross. Some albatross don't land on solid ground for years at a time and just fly over the open ocean. And then of course that's a penguin. So I really like the idea of some Eocene bird being like, I have two eggs, you to the sea and you to the sky. <laughs> because I cannot believe that they are sisters to each other. I think it's really fun. Um, obviously, most birds today are songbirds, this order right here, and here's some of the songbirds closest relatives. Fun, fun, fun things to talk about. We're going to talk about this group when I see you guys next. So, okay, I will let you go.